We're going to spend some time now uh, talking and discussing the eight major approaches there are to psychology. Some of them, I, I don't know that they're considered major, but they're kind of spin-offs of other ones, and they're distinct in their own way. So, so we'll talk through them and so, sort of the research methodologies that they use and some important people. The first one that we'll look at is the biological approach. Biological psychology is worth looking at and understanding that it's very much uh, drawing from the science of biology, as its name suggests. And these psychologists try to understand how our anatomy and physiology works hand in hand with our behavior. How is it that how we're made up affects our behavior? So in order to understand this, they do a lot of biological experimentation on psychological problems. So really focusing on the nuts and bolts and the inner workings of the brains and the neurons and those sorts of things. And in order to get that information through this biological perspective, researchers use CAT scans, MRIs, EEGs, or PET scans. So ways where they're seeing imaging of the brain and they'd have subjects do different activities while looking at the brain or if they have someone who's got some abnormal psychology going on they would uh, check their brains to see if there's anything different and just looking at the biological makeup the way the neurons fire the way that our brains interact with our bodies is there something in there that can help us explain our psychologies and so that's really the biological approach and that's the way that these uh, psychologists would look at things Going in a similar vein to that biological approach, and that's kind of a, these are kind of the minor fields right now. Um, they're, they're, they're relevant, they're respected, but there's not a lot of work being done there, quite simply because they're really hard to measure. Like we're talking here behavioral genetics, and in behavioral genetics, um, psychologists try and look and understand how some behaviors are based off uh, genetic characteristics that we have, in particular genes that we possess. And so they're looking at biological predispositions that people may be predisposed to alcoholism or to abuse or to um, certain patterns of behavior. But that's a really complex thing because as we all know, there's no one set of genes that determines who we are. There's, there's countless um, strands of our genes that match up and they all play a different role. And so there's all sorts of variables and factors that go into this. So um, they look at different genetics in order to determine if those can predispose someone to a certain behavior. And the easiest way for them to do this is to use sets of twins um, because this also allows them then to look at how the environment plays a role in these behaviors. So in twins, you have the same genes. But if those twins are raised in separate circumstances, then it's the idea of is it nature or is it nurture? Or if they're raised in similar circumstances but perhaps have different peer groups, that's also a different way you can see because the peer group may affect uh, one twin differently than another. So behavioral genetics is kind of this new field and it's really murky and it's really hard to get any conclusive evidence because we're still working on understanding the human genome and how that then applies to different behaviors. So this is kind of, I'd say this is one of the emerging fields, but it's also really difficult to pin down because it is so uh, complex and still so new. When we talk then about one of the more uh, classical and famous ones, we're talking about behavioral psychology and behaviorism. Um, and behaviorism is this camp that says that psychology is the study of observable behavior. Behaviors are the actions of people that are act or organisms that are actually observable, that we can see. And by being able to see it, then we have empirical evidence that we can make conclusions based off of. And so behaviorists really focus on behaviors because they can be observed. And they discount the idea of mind and mental events uh, because they, they can't be observed. So how do you record those? How do you get good evidence from those? And one of the main takeaways from the school of behaviorism is a, a thing called classical conditioning. And that is where you have a neutral stimulus and you condition people to learn a behavior based off that. The first person to identify this and the most famous is Ivan Pavlov, who would uh, famously worked with dogs. He would ring a bell and give the dog a treat. Ring a bell, give the dog a treat. Ring a bell, give the dog a treat. And again, that so the neutral stimulus is ringing the bell and the treat is the conditioning 
so that after a while of this, the dog was conditioned to expect a treat when the bell was rung. So we'd ring the bell and the dog would expect the treat. Ringing the bell is a neutral stimulus. It doesn't mean good or bad, it just is. But then there's this conditioning to, when this happens, expect this. So Pavlov first identified it. And then another famous psychologist, John Watson, comes along and applies this classical conditioning to humans through an experiment that's another famous psychology experiment known as the Little Albert experiment. They took a toddler named Albert who was, I think, nine months. Uh, and they had, ta they had Albert playing with a rat, um, a laboratory rat. And the rat is a, the rat is a uh, neutral stimulus. Just, it just is. It just exists. But what Watson wanted to figure out is if he could condition the child to react negatively towards the rat. So what he would do is when the child started petting the rat, he would make a loud noise behind the child. And this would scare the child, and so the child would start crying. So anytime that the child petted the rat, there would be a loud noise and it would scare him. And so he would cry and scream. And eventually what would happen is when the child saw the rat the child started to scream and cry and want to move away from the rat because the child had been conditioned to think that the rat was negative, although the rat was itself originally a neutral stimulus. And so this showed that you could change behaviors, that you could condition people to act in a certain way given a certain set of conditions. Uh, and so this is really an important thing. And so another psychologist named B.F. Skinner comes along, who's super important, one of the most famous psychologists, most influential. Uh, he's a behaviorist, and he thinks that humans associate behavioral responses with environmental outcomes. So our environment would really shape our behavior and could shape our behavior in positive and negative ways. Uh, and so this is an important school of thought. It is no longer the major school of psychology, but it did shape a really important field or kind of branch of psychology, which is behavior modification. Uh, and in behavior modification, you try to uh, unlearn bad behaviors through kind of various uh, behavioral methods and trainings. You train people out of bad behaviors because according to behaviorism and classical conditioning, bad behaviors are a result or negative behaviors are a result of our conditioning. And so, in behaviorism, you can modify people. The problem with behaviorism is it kind of acts people like it pushes the idea that people are just kind of like robots that are just kind of existing and, and responding to everything without having any sense of free will. And so that's kind of a critique of behaviorism. Cognitive psychology is kind of the new uh, predominant psychological approach uh, in the United States. It has replaced behavioral psychology. Um, within the last few decades. And in cognitive psychology, the idea is that to understand how people behave, we need to really understand how they perceive the world around them and then how they are thinking, how they are personally aware of their cognitive, that is their thinking processes, and how that affects the way they view the world around them. So we're looking at the conscious, not the subconscious, but how they consciously think about the world around them and how they're picking up on the environment. In order to do this, um, cognitive psychologists kind of combine the two major early approaches of structuralist and functionalist. So cognitives look at the subcomponents of thoughts, that is feelings, emotions, sensations, and the purpose of thought. Like, why are you thinking that? Why are you even thinking in this moment? And by doing this, they can combine those ideas in order to get a better understanding of why people are behaving the way that they are. And so in order to kind of gather this data, which is what psychology is all about, um, they use reaction time tests, they use computer models, and then they use introspection as well, that self-reporting of what were you thinking at any given time. Uh, and in doing all of this, then we're, they're able to kind of see how uh, and put together this idea of how people are thinking and reacting to the world around them. So cognitive is kind of an important field. The humanistic approach is uh, more of a holistic look at a personality and there's this idea of humans have free will and humans are good and inherently good and can achieve good things and so this is based off kind of the classical uh, studying of the consciousness and, and self-actualization and self-realization 
Um, so they put a real high emphasis on personal values and goals and how that influences behavior. Uh, so if you have expectations for yourself, if you believe in yourself, how does that affect your behavior? And in fact, humanistic psychology is also still a really prominent um, discipline in today's world. Uh, two of the most famous people at this time are Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers. Maslow is most well known for two things. One, the idea of self-actualization, and that is that individuals, uh, in order to reach their full potential, they need to have creativity, they need to know their limits and their strengths, and they need to accept who they are and the nature of who they are. So they need to know that they can achieve great things, but they also need to recognize their limits. So they need to be self-conscious, they need to be self-aware, and hold themselves to high expectations, but also recognize their shortcomings. Uh, and Maslow's other major idea is his hierarchy of needs, which we'll definitely look at later. But it's the idea that until people have the basics, that is shelter, food, water, and security, they can't move on to the self-actualization. They can't reach their full potential. So they cannot create. They cannot inspire. They cannot go higher than that because they are, at their very nature, just trying to survive. So Maslow's uh, really kind of foundational in this humanistic approach. The other one is Carl Rogers, who uh, really emphasizes positive self-conception and really kind of a positive self-image as being important to achieving the self-actualization that Maslow had talked about previously. So if you have positive interactions, if you are a positive person, if you have positive self-identification, then you can achieve good things. And Rogers pushes for the idea of unconditional positive regard. And that is accepting someone regardless of what they say or do. So in psychology, if you have someone who's struggling with addiction or some other problems, uh, according to Rogers, we need to still have positive regard for them. So we accept them and support them regardless of what they say or do, regardless of if they fail in their treatment, regardless of if they're struggling, regardless of if they're acting out, we still support them no matter their mistakes. And by supporting them, by having this positive regard, then they can eventually reach this self-actualization and can achieve at their highest potential. So humanists really kind of look at the world in um, a glass half full kind of way, in a positive, and want to maintain positivity in order to achieve change. Um, the psychoanalytic approach is a little bit kind of out of style. Um, it is best known for uh, Sigmund Freud, but psychoanalysis really emphasizes childhood experiences and then children's relation with their parents as being uh, foundational to the development of their personality and who they are. But unlike the cognitive approach, it really focuses on repressed feelings, and those are things that are buried in the unconscious, things that we're not thinking about necessarily, but we're still acting on. Um, and so... Psychoanal psychoanalytical psychologists or psychodynamic psychologists say that these unresolved conflicts shape who we are today. So if people are behaving in a negative manner or have bad habits or behavior, they argue that that is a result of unresolved, unconscious conflicts from when they were children. And the way to get through this is to kind of talk it out. And the first person, as I said, to come up with this is Sigmund Freud. Um, and he develops this theory on human behavior. He's very much not just about children and their relationship with parents, but he focuses also on repressed sexuality and repressed sexual desires as shaping who we are. And I think that's why so many people are pushed away from this, because it does seem kind of weird and a little bit kooky on the fringes. But there is some good things happening in this field of psychology. Uh, and in this, there's really, they're the first to kind of define this distinction between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. And the conscious mind is when we are aware of what we are doing. It's those things that humans we are aware of, that we are cognizant of, and that we can recognize. And the unconscious mind is mental processes that we, we don't know that we're even doing, that are just happening um, as part of our daily nature and daily routine. But they, they argue that these still have a major influence on us in some way. And it's the combination of these two and the balance and fight between these two that shape our behavior and the way that we are as humans. The sociocultural approach is also a new one uh, in the, really the 21st century, uh, late 21st century. And in this, sociocultural psychologists 
suggests that the environment that people live in has a huge influence on how they behave and how other people kind of experience and perceive that behavior. And it's just this recognition that different cultures have different norms and different values. And because of that, what may be normal in one society is strange or perceived as strange in another. And so when we're talking about behaviors in, in humans, we cannot say that the behaviors in humans in the United States would be the same as the behaviors in humans in Argentina or Sudan or Mongolia, because it's going to be different based off those cultural norms, those cultural expectations, and just kind of what's available socially. Uh, and so there's all these variations. So to try and create some grand unified theory, according to sociocultural psychologists, is really difficult. And we really need to understand each culture in order to make a judgment on the behavior of the people in that culture. And so it's being kind of self-aware and recognizing differences in humanity. So that's kind of a new field. It's expanding the horizons and it's really taking a positive look and valuing and emphasizing that these differences are good and people should be proud of who they are, where they come from, and their various cultures. Then we have evolutionary uh, psychology and this is built, built off the theories of Charles Darwin. Um, and they argue, evolutionary psychologists argue that behaviors can be best described um, about how valuable that behavior is to our survival. And so they argue that we would have weaned off of behaviors that were not meaningful or helpful for survival. And so these behaviors must have something to do with that. It must have been naturally selected through our evolutionary cycle. And so an example is this idea of fear, and fear is a response. Um, it's an adaptive evolutionary response to perceived danger because without fear, if we're not afraid of anything, our survival as a species is jeopardized. So the behavior of fear in people has to have some natural evolutionary purpose and we cannot really fight that. We can seek to understand it and adapt it in some way. This is similar to the behavioral genetics approach where they're looking at this Evolutionary looks a little more holistically at the nature of humans. Behavioral genetics are looking at the individual genes of people, but there's a real like overlap to these two schools of thought. And so kind of the best way to look at this um, is through this chart, which kind of goes over here. You can see the, the various approaches. You can see the questions um, that they may have asked. These psychologists may have asked these types of questions. Uh, and then you have the causes of the behavior, like what is causing these things to happen, according to these psychologists, and how they may study this, um, and how they may get at, at these uh, kind of questions and searching to kind of change people. So those that's kind of a brief overview of these eight approaches uh, and how they, how they work in psychology today. None of them are considered wrong. Um, none of them is considered more right than others. Some are just more in style than others at certain time. And so really kind of understanding these approaches is important as we look through the rest of this course.